Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sonis. What's happening, Jim? I'm all good, Greg, because today we're talking baseball, and it seems like there is some momentum to potentially have a baseball season not too far down the line. So I'm starting to get back in the flow of things. I have a dynasty startup draft going on right now. So getting back in the tune of baseball here. So I am excited. How are you doing? Some would say that baseball has the least amount of momentum right now, given all their <laughs> labor disputes happening. Uh, but I'm excited. I just want it back. I'm excited to talk baseball. It's been so long since you and I have got a chance to chat about it. So I'm excited for today's episode. So on the show today, we're going to break down some of the awards that may take place if the season ever takes place. Some good odds you can get right now over at the FanDuel Sportsbook. So we'll begin with a player that is plus 7,500 to win the AL MVP, and that is Juan Moncada. Yeah, Greg, a theme for today is going to be players with longer odds because no matter how things wind up shaking out for the schedule they do wind up creating, it's going to be shorter than usual. And that's going to lead to a lot of increased variance because it takes a long time for stats to stabilize across Major League Baseball. And sometimes even 162 games is not enough for stats to stabilize. So I want to look at volatile players with longer odds. You don't get a, a lot more volatile than Yoan Moncada. 75 to 1 to win, like you said. And I think that he's my favorite bet on the board right now for individual bases because last year he did cut down his strikeout rate quite a bit and still hit for a lot of power. And I like it when guys can make more contact but still make hard contact. That's what Moncada did last year with the Chicago White Sox. The other big thing for Moncada from an MVP perspective is that his, his defense was a lot better once he moved into third base. And I think that bodes well for him because I think that when you look at MVP voting the past couple of years, it seems like voters do look at you know all-inclusive stats like wins above replacement. And that does account for defense. And Moncada playing good defense at third base should boost him in those types of metrics. Moncada is entering his age 25 season. He could be on a team that's primed to make a surge here this year. Teams benefit as well from a, a shorter schedule. So yeah, Mike Trout is a favorite. That's justified. But with a shortened season, a lot of weird things can happen. So I am very okay fading Mike Trout, going with someone with a lot longer odds. And to me, the guy who sticks out the most there is Yohan Moncada at 75 to 1 to win the AL MVP. I think you're going to see some weird awards if this baseball season does happen. And you're absolutely right. In a condensed season, there's a good chance that someone just gets hot and walks away with the MVP and the Cy Young. And it's a player that we're not used to seeing in this mix or hasn't gotten there yet. Mike Trout, I think it's an easy fade. I think back to Ubaldo Jimenez, right? That one half a season. If it was only half a season that they played, he would have been the Cy Young Award winner. Obviously, we know what happened there. But while Yohan Makata, probably a better player than Yohan Jimenez, or at least we hope, is a good bet here at 75-1. to 1. Let's go over to the NL MVP, where it's not as long of odds. We want to talk about a guy that's motivated. Well, it's on the other side of Chicago, and that is Chris Bryant. As we head over to the north side here, why do you like Chris Bryant 35-1? to 1? How come you're not going anyone longer than that? I just think that the number on Chris Bryant specifically is kind of too good for me to pass up because – with Yohan Moncada, we have not seen him put it together, you know, on a truly elite level for a full season yet. Last year was pretty close to a truly elite level. But with Chris Bryant, we have. And it was not too far, too far in the distant past because if you look at his three full seasons, his first three full seasons in baseball, he had 6.1, 7.9, and 6.7 wins above replacement. And those were in his age 23 through age 25 seasons. Then he had injuries uh, in his age 26 season. Last year, Brian didn't get a lot of hype, but he actually was really good. He had a 382 on base percentage, and now you get him an additional year removed from those injuries that dragged down his numbers back in 2018. You mentioned motivation will be on his side, wants to earn that money, and I think that we're going to see a good Chris Bryant this year. He's been working on uh, his swing plane in the offseason, trying to e increase his or optimize his launch angle. I think that's really encouraging. So I think that with Chris Bryant, what you're getting here on a number of 35 to 1 is you're buying low on a player who we've seen be a superstar in the not-too-distant past. We know why he slipped. It was due to injuries, but now he's had time to rest up. He is still on a good team, you know, maybe not as good as they were in the past, but still a good team with the Chicago Cubs, and Bryant has superstar, uh, a cal superstar caliber season within his range of outcomes. We know he is a household name as well, so... Chris Bryant, 35 to 1, not as long as Moncada, but I think given what we've seen in his past, I think that uh, it makes sense to buy into him at 35 to 1 and buy low, coming off a couple of seasons influenced by injuries. 
We could just buy the third baseman in Chicago. You're in a good spot. But Chris Bryant has already shown his ability to be a superstar. And he has been forgotten about. I know in fantasy baseball circles, people don't want Chris Bryant. Well, he may not be as exciting as he once was or he was a little bit younger. He's got a lot of reasons to want to put up a huge season this year. Chris Bryant, a good spot to be a long shot bet to be the NL MVP. Let's stick in Chicago and let's talk about the AL Cy Young and the possibility that Lucas Giolito continues to take the next step. Obviously, he broke out last year, and a lot of fantasy experts are jumping in on him this season. Now, what's good about Lucas Giolito, I don't know if you're going to talk about this here, Jim, but if they're playing a condensed schedule and they're only playing their division, it's a nice division you're going to play in repeatedly with the Tigers and the Royals in it. We know about your Twins, and the Indians are always pretty good. But to play all those games against the Tigers and the Royals, well, that's good. Yeah, it definitely is. I think that Giolito is a pitcher you could buy into even regardless of that because of what he did last year, which you alluded to, Greg. You said that he broke out. And it was a breakout we can explain because when you look at his pitch usage, there was a major deviation with Lucas Giolito. Something we'll talk about with you Darvish coming up too is I like pitchers whose breakouts and changes in performance I can explain based on some sort of change they made. For Lucas Giolito, that was a change to his changeup usage. He actually threw his changeup 27.5% of the time from May 7th on. And in that time, his strikeout rate was 33%, and his walk rate went down to 7.5%. It's easy to forget that Giolito was pretty bad in the month of April, but he turned things around in a major way and sustained it from May 7th all the way through the end of the year. If you have a 33% strikeout rate, you are going to be a contender for the Cy Young Award. We're seeing that to an extent with Giolito at 22 to 1, but I don't think he's getting as much respect as he deserves, given the fact that he was a really good prospect and had explainable success over a large sample last year. The only question I think you could have with Yoan Moncada and Lucas Giolito is, will the White Sox be good enough to justify betting a couple of guys to win team? what is essentially at some point a team-level award? Most guys do not win these awards without having team-level success. Less so for Cy Young than for MVP, but I think with Giolito and the White Sox, I think they should be good enough to push for a playoff spot. We could see expanded playoffs as well. It sounds like based on the proposition the players have put forward, that could boost them as well. And they did make some offseason additions. Yasmani Grandal could benefit G- Lucas Giolito. Edwin Encarnacion can increase the offense as well. I think the White Sox are a sneaky team to keep an eye on in the American League Central to push for a playoff spot. And if they do so, guys like Giolito and Moncada are going to get national recognition, and they could have good enough numbers where they can push for player-level awards. Giolito, 22-1 to to win the American League Cy Young. I am buying into what we saw last year, and I think that if he does that again, he's going to be a name to watch as the end of the season approaches. I think that number is really, really good for Lucas Giolito. As you said, you can explain why he was good. He's a former top prospect. He really struggled in his first taste of the majors, really struggled in April. And then the light turned on. It wasn't just a light turning on. It was, well, a change in the pitches that he was throwing. When you can explain it like that, and he was able to sustain it all the way from May through September, there's a lot of good there. Like you said, a bit of a team award. If the White Sox are good, people are going to be looking at them for awards, like Juan Moncada as an MVP candidate, and certainly Lucas Giolito as a Cy Young candidate here in 2020. But he's not the only pitcher in Chicago we want to believe in as a potential Cy Young Award winner because Hugh Darvish is also up there, another player that had a really rough first half and couldn't find the plate and then turned it around in the second half, and there weren't many pitchers in baseball that were better. I don't know if there were any, honestly, Greg. It was, it was insane to watch you Darpa's turn it on. And it's insane watching his numbers in spring training, how bad they were there and how bad he was through April and through May. And then on June 21st, he started to lean on this splitter that he started throwing. And I mean, the, the, everything just flipped immediately. It became a different U Darvish that we saw from that point on. From June 21st on, U Darvish had a 2.67 skill interactive ERA. He had a 35.8% strikeout rate and a 2.9% walk rate. I love Giolito's numbers, but Darvish was even better in both the strikeout and the walk rate category, which is pretty insane given where he was early on that year. If we see you, Darvish, carry those gains into 2020, a Cy Young Award is very much within his range of outcomes. Now, the White or with the Cubs, you have similar questions. The White Sox can have enough team level success to justify betting players like this, but if they get this performance out of you, Darvish, the odds that they push for the playoffs are going to be higher because they're going to have better pitching, and that's a good thing as well. If Chris Bryant can get back to where he was, that's going to bode well for the entire team. So. 
I am willing to buy into Chicago in general, whether it be the White Sox or the Cubs. And I think that you, Darvish, if the Cubs do really well, he's going to be one of those first names we look at as being a key contributor to that success and potentially as a National League Cy Young as well. A lot of pitchers last year had trouble with that grip on the same old ball that there always was. But when you, Darvish, figured it out at the end of June, he was a different pitcher. And if he could change, uh, turn that success in a major success here in 2020, if they do play, well, you Darvish as good of any choice to be the NL Cy Young Award winner if he could wrestle the award away from Jacob DeGrom. Now let's take a look at a hitter that may hit the most home runs of anybody here in 2020. But my only question, Jim, is you couldn't find anybody in Chicago to have this award? I tried. I tried really hard, Greg, but it was really hard to lay off of Miguel Sano. And the Chicago aspect is pretty interesting because they actually benefit from the same line of thinking that I'm applying to Miguel Sano, where Miguel Sano is benefiting from the way this schedule plays out. Because think about park factors, Greg. What do we know about Minnesota in April? It is cold. And the ball does not fly well when it's really cold. You know, I remember Oswaldo Arcia wearing like uh, like a full on like face mask one time because he wanted to stay warm because it was so cool. They're playing in Chicago there, uh, but a Minnesota twin playing in cold weather. That drags down their numbers for the month of April and to a certain extent, the month of May as well. We're not going to have those months in the schedule. We may have October, which would be a different discussion, but if they play through the end of October or through the end of September, we're going to be seeing our entire sample of Minnesota Twins baseball this year being played in warm weather. And Minnesota in July is hot, it is humid, and that is when the ball flies best. In hot and humid conditions, that bodes well for Miguel Sano. Last year, Sano, 34 home runs and just 439 plate appearances. He is tied for 13th in projected home runs this year based on Dan Zimborski's if projections over at Fangraphs. That's over just 482 plate appearances. If we have a truncated schedule, the gap in volume between the top end guys and those guys who need a couple of days off like Miguel Sano is going to be less, less worrisome than it would be other points of the year. If it were a longer schedule, we'd, we'd worry more about longevity and durability in guys like Sano. So I think that you give him that with a warmer park and you give him all the massive power that he has, Sano could really shine in this scenario. It's going to be hot. It's going to be humid in Minnesota. That bodes well for Miguel Sano, and he is good enough to take advantage. So as long as he can make contact once or twice per game, I think we could see some really impressive home run numbers out of Miguel Sano this year. Not having to play in April or May, the ball should be flying out of Minnesota. And you know, Jim's a Twins fan when we get an Oswaldo Arcia mention here (laughs) in 2020. But Sano, the power's certainly legitimate. And if he doesn't have to worry about staying on the field for 162 games, he doesn't have to worry even about playing the field for 162 games. He's going to be in there more often than not. And hopefully the power uh, will come along with him. We know it will. It just will be more than anybody else. He's got to lead the league in home runs. He certainly has the ability to do so. Not a bad bet there on Miguel Sano. One last player award we want to mention. It's not really an award. It's just someone that's going to lead the league in strikeouts. I think it's interesting you're going here with Blake Snell. A lot of controversy, of course, surrounding Blake Snell. And even if he's going to play this season, given his controversial comments a couple of weeks ago. I know there's a lot of bad juju surrounding Blake Snell at the moment. But, Jim, you're still buying on him to lead the AL in strikeouts. Yeah, definitely. Because I think that with Blake Snell, we can talk about the comments that he made and and the way that he made them for sure. But if he plays this year, I think that this is a really intriguing bet at 30 to 1. And I think that he benefits in a similar way to Miguel Sano, where if it's a shorter season, the gap in volume between the top end guys and some guys with a little bit less volume is going to be less noticeable than it would be otherwise, which means we can lean more on rate stats. And Blake Snell last year coming off the injuries didn't pitch super deep into games. That matters a lot. We're talking about aggregate strikeouts for an entire season but with the shorter schedule it's not going to matter as much and guys with a little bit lesser volume can lead the league in strikeouts even if as long as their rates are high enough and with Blake Snell there's really no question about those rates last year a 33.3 percent strikeout rate it was 31.6 the year before that now he goes into his age 27 season we have seen him excel in the big leagues for a while now several years I know that the ERA last year was not good but the peripheral numbers especially once he heated up over the summer they were really good so like Snell as long as he plays I would expect him to do really well in the strikeout department the one big issue I have with him again comes down to the fact that he doesn't pitch as deep into games as guys like Justin Verlander Max Scherzer Trevor Bauer but 
you're taking that one concern and making it a little bit lesser. And I think that gives us some value on Blake Snell. 30 to 1 to lead the league in strikeouts. I think that he is a good bet at that number just because the ratios are so good. And hopefully, we could see him a little bit angry on the mound as well this year. It's all about being on the mound for Blake Snell. Yes, he made those comments, but he also battled that elbow injury last year. He was missing some time in spring training, although he did think he was going to be ready for opening day. He's got time to be healthy. He looks healthy on his Twitch streams, but you do wonder if he has the ability to even go the distance. I know it's a condensed season. I know you don't need him to go deep in the games uh, in order to get this, uh, get the most strikeouts in the AL. But still, a lot of question marks for Blake Snell. But I guess that's why you can get him here at plus 3,000 to lead the league. That's going to do it for us here on the FanDuel Hurry Up. Jim, we appreciate the time. It was great talking baseball, man. Yeah, I missed it, Greg. It's been a long time, but it's back, and uh, we are excited for a brand new season. It should be a whole lot of fun, and I hope that they are able to work this stuff out because I just want to watch some baseball. I want that, I want that in my life, so hopefully we can get back there again soon and talk more baseball here on the Hurry Up as well. That would be awesome. I'm excited just to just to get back in it and be able to watch, you know, everything every night, play a little fantasy baseball, play some DFS over on FanDuel and uh, have some fun. On Wednesday, I'll be back with Gabe Morancy. We'll talk some UFC this Saturday night. Amanda Nunez in action. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sussman. Stay safe, everybody.